three years ago, I walked outside of my rather typical looking office building on an unusually warm January morning. I look over my shoulder and across the parking lot is a man lying on his back with two construction workers standing above him. One of the construction workers kind of leaned down and pushed the man on the chest and then gave up. I can't tell you exactly what happened next, but I remember running to them, screaming something about CPR and 911. And one of them saying, I think he might still be breathing. I had taken CPR classes in the past, but never did any of that information come in handy until that morning. I bent down and grabbed him by the wrist to see if I could find a pulse and couldn't. I laid my head on his chest to see if I could hear him breathing, but couldn't because my own heart was beating so fast that was the only sound I could hear. His eyes were open but rolled towards the back of his head. I put my hand to his mouth to see if I could feel breath and couldn't. And then I placed the palm of my hand on his sternum and the other one on top of it, and together I began to push, push so hard that I thought I was going to break his ribs as you are supposed to do. Pushing so hard on the chest of a man whose name I didn't even know. Push, push, push. Wait, how many of these do I do before I deliver the two rescue breaths? Push, push, push. Is it 30? It is 30, but how many have I done thus far? Push, push. Yeah, and I'm supposed to do it like really fast, like to that Bee Gees song, staying alive. Ha, ha, staying alive, staying alive. This is insane. Push, push, push. It's time to stop and deliver the two rescue breaths. I put one hand on his forehead and the other on his chin and I, I tilted his head back so that the airway would be sure to be open. I opened his mouth to see if I could see any obstruction in his throat, but couldn't. And then I leaned down. I put my lips to his and I blew. Do you ever have those moments where you touch something and your mind is instantly transported back to a, a memory from long ago. When I put my lips to his, his mustache tickled my face. And I was instantly transported back to when I was a kid of five or six years old. And we used to kiss my dad goodnight before he we went to bed. And his mustache would tickle my face. My dad had passed away about 10 months prior to this due to a massive stroke. It was my siblings and I that made the decision to terminate his life support. It's a very difficult decision to end someone's life. But now here was this man, this man who was about my dad's age and who kind of looked like my dad. And his life was in my hands. I had a second chance to maybe save a life instead of end one. And I wasn't going to let him, a man whose name I didn't even know, die. One thing they don't teach you in CPR class is that when you involuntarily force air into someone's lungs, the body's natural reaction is to fight, and it coughs and it spits back in your face, even though the body is unconscious. And then you have to go back in a second time to deliver a second rescue breath. And as you do, you have to watch the chest rise to ensure that air is getting to the lungs. 
There's more coughing and spitting in my face, and it's back to reality. It's time to push again, hand over hand, right over the breastbone where the ribs come together. Push, damn it, push, push. Keep count this time. Push, push, please, breathe again. Please, wake up, push, push. Please, Dad, please, wake up, Dad. Is that sirens in the background? Please, be sirens, Dad. Wake up, please, Dad. Push, push, do not stop pushing with cycles of rescue breath until help arrives. The ambulance came screeching into the parking lot, and the paramedics jumped out, and they did their chest compressions, and they shocked him twice with the defibrillator. And they couldn't get his heart restarted. They loaded the man into the back of the ambulance with the two construction workers, and off they sped. And then all of a sudden, I was alone in that parking lot as if nothing ever happened. I fell to the ground in tears, and I couldn't stand up. I cried for this stranger, and I cried all over again for my dad. Later that day, I went to the closest ER to find out if the man whose name I didn't even know had lived or died. It was the same hospital, the same ER room that they took my dad to during his stroke. And in that same little nurse's window, I was now asking about the life of a different man. The nurse asked for his name. I said, I did not know. She said, well, are you his family? No, I'm not. I'm sorry if you're not his family. There's nothing I can tell you. Please, I said. I did CPR on him in the parking lot, and I, I just want to know if he lived or died. I'm sorry, she said. I can't tell you anything. And then she turned to the nurse next to her and rather loudly said, Hey, that cardiac from earlier, they took him to surgery, right? We need to call his family. And that was all I knew. I was tore up inside. And I began to obsess about the survivability of CPR. According to several studies and information from the American Heart Association, 40 to 45% of persons who receive out-of-hospital CPR, where a bystander is the one performing the CPR, survive long enough to get to the hospital. Of those 40, only 20 will live to be discharged. Of the 20 that live to be discharged, 15 to 18 of them will suffer moderate to severe brain damage from lack of oxygen and have their lives, their mobility, their functionality negatively impacted. Only two to five will ever return to normal lives. There's a lot they teach you in CPR class about saving lives. But there's a lot they don't. They don't teach you what to do after the ambulance pulls away. They don't teach you how to be brave and act like a hero and not regret your actions. The few people I told about this told me I was brave and I was a hero. But I didn't feel like any of those things. Based on this guy's very slim chances of survival, 
I felt like a failure. And I, I didn't even know if he was alive or dead. If he was alive, based on my obsessive research, he might have had brain damage that would require a ton of costly medical care. And what if his family couldn't live with that additional burden in his lives? If he did make a full recovery, what if that hospital stay was so expensive that it drove him to bankruptcy? If he were alive, did he wish he were dead? There's a lot they teach you in CPR class about how to save lives. But how to live with yourself after trying to save a life isn't one of them. Three months after that incident, without ever learning what happened to the man whose name I didn't know, I walked back into that rather typical looking office building. And there he stood, upright and alive. He asked if I was Ryan, because it turned out I was a stranger to him too. I said yes, and he grabbed me and he put me in this big bear hug. And he thanked me. He told me that he had learned that I was the one that had performed CPR on him. And without that CPR, he wouldn't be standing here today. It turned out he had a massive blockage in his heart, and the surgeons were able to quickly remove it in time that his heart just started right back up. He was one of those lucky 2 to 5% that returned to a normal life and was already back to work as a carpenter. If it were you, lying on that ground, suffering from cardiac arrest, and knowing what you know now, would you want a stranger to perform CPR on you? And could you be that stranger for someone else? The man and I hugged, and he thanked me one more time. And I? I finally got to learn his name. Thank you.